at one point in junior high school, I was targeted and I was attacked because these um, students assumed that I was white. My name is Natalie Devora. I am an African-American woman with albinism. I am a white-skinned Black woman. This was the 1960s, a time of serious racial tension in America. Both Black and white people were rioting and carrying out beatings. So things were rough for Devora at her junior high school in Oakland, California, where most of the students were Black, and she looked white. It was the end of the school day, and I, you know, like all of my peers were leaving school and all of a sudden I feel someone grab my hair from the back. Her attackers were Black students. One of the things I recall saying just over and over again is, I'm not white. And that was something that they just did not hear or pay attention to. And what I remember is just being horribly beaten by these girls and called white, called, you know, uh, horrible things. And um, being horribly traumatized as a result of it. Huh, I didn't realize well, that's that. an interesting question. You know, I've never heard of it from that. So let's talk about that. Let's talk no, about I think that. you need to come over, stand in my shoes. This is Top of Mind. I'm Julie Rose. As a woman with albinism, Natalie Devora is of two worlds. Her parents are black, but she has white skin. So which race is she? And what about dark-skinned people with vitiligo? That's a condition where the skin slowly loses pigmentation, so it becomes partly dark, partly light. Is skin color really the ultimate indicator of race? Today on the show, what is race? A little later, a couple of experts will explain why biological race in humans does not actually exist. Now, they're not saying race doesn't exist. They're saying that the way most of us think about race is wrong and that our misconceptions have serious consequences. Natalie Devora's identity as a white-skinned Black woman is an excellent place to start this exploration. If you took a snapshot of her on the day we spoke, here's what you'd see. A woman with very fair skin, wearing glasses with magenta frames. Um, my hair is straightened and curled, sort of in the, the whole Marilyn Monroe hairstyle. But it's a very, very pale, pale blonde. My eyes are translucent. Um, so they tend to either appear red or blue, depending on what I'm wearing. You call yourself a, a white-skinned Black woman. Why? I mean, your skin is white. You could say you're a white woman. Uh, one could. But my lived experience and who I come from and my community and my family are all Black. So while, yes, I am white presenting in a lot of ways, who I know myself to be is a Black woman. Culturally. As, Culturally. A, her as a heritage. Correct. It is also looking at... Um, the other members in my family, looking at my grandmothers, um, my grandfathers, and um, and my father, really assessing like these culturally. These are the people that I come from, and also recognizing um, mannerisms, recognizing forms of speech. All of those things are a part of identity. But society has rarely been willing to recognize that identity for Devora. There was one occasion where we were out as a family on a you know Saturday afternoon, and this this happened frequently where we were at a you know department store, and someone who was white asked my mother, "Like, why do you have that white child?" And we, as children, were 
accustomed to my mother having to defend me and defend her right that I was her child. One of the things that my mother did, which was this incredible gift, when I was probably five or six, there was one day I was just looking at myself in a mirror, trying to find her features in mine. And she sat me on the bed and she just said, you can touch my face and you can feel how your nose is my nose, how your lips are my lips. And that was a very intimate um, experience to have with her. And to also from a um, tactile perspective to understand how our facial features were the same. That's something I will always treasure and remember. Some of Devorah's most upsetting experiences with racial identity have happened among other Black people. Once in the 80s, she went to a writing circle specifically for women of color. It was held in a bookstore after hours. There were about 20 women clustered among the bookshelves. I had my own uh, nervousness about it because I had been um, really shunned in other instances. And so I I went, which required a lot of courage on my part. And during the course of being there and, and we are writing and there is a person, a woman who wrote something that was explicitly um, directed at me about why should I be allowed to be present at this event. She shared it out loud. And in my mind, all I could think is, you see, I shouldn't have come. And I took several breaths. And she, she did not know that you had albinism. She, all she knew was what she saw. Correct. And, uh, and she created an assumption based on her visual cues. And so how did you respond? I ultimately wrote something in response and read it aloud that while I may appear different, that I am the same. I too have a right to belong. It it actually was received quite well. And and after the uh, event was over, many people came up to speak to me and, and commended me for staying and commended me for actually responding. Explaining that she has albinism is usually enough for Black people to accept Devora as one of their own, but occasionally she has to prove her Blackness. This happened once in Tanzania at an international conference for people with albinism, of all places. Many of the people there with albinism simply assumed I was Caucasian, and when I told them I wasn't, they they didn't believe me, and it literally took me having to pull up photos on my phone of me with my family for people to believe me. What I was told by many of the people there from varying countries, um, because there were people represented of 30 African nations there, um, is that I don't possess, I didn't, for them, I didn't possess true um, African features or Black features. That's ironic. It was truly ironic. It was um, truly surprising and a bit hurtful. Now, sometimes having people assume she's white is an advantage. It happens as simple as, say, going through TSA at the airport that I am way less likely to be stopped and have additional security um, measures than, say, someone like my daughter. Her adult daughter does not have albinism. Her skin is dark. When I see that she's being profiled in a way that is inappropriate, I call attention to that. So as a white-skinned Black woman, Natalie Devora has experienced rejection in Black circles and acceptance in white circles. And that gives her some unusual power to tackle racism. I understand that I possess skin privilege. And 
overall, my focus is how do I use that for good? How can I help to make a difference through the form of educating, through the form of um, calling attention directly to um, situations of adversity? And I know that I frequently have the option of doing that. And despite the challenges of her racial identity, Devorah says she wouldn't change her skin color, even if she could. In as much as um, being African-American is a part of who I am, being a person with albinism is a part of who I am. If you had been adopted by a white family, do you think you would still consider yourself African-American? I think that's an interesting question because... I was unofficially adopted by a white family as a late teen, early adult. Hmm. And um, I clearly still identified as Black. And I also understood yet again that I had a choice and how I chose to um, describe myself. When people see me with my um, adoptive mom, it, there is an assumption that I am white. Do, do you think do you think everybody has the ability to make that choice? So a more provocative way to say that would be, suppose a white child is adopted into a black family as an infant. That child's raised as a black person you know, or at least in an African-American culture, right? Um, So maybe they take on the mannerisms, maybe they have their, the hairstyles, their skin is obviously not black. Can they claim blackness? You know, again, I think that that's a subjective thing. I think that someone can certainly claim um, cultural awareness, Uh, because the world will always see them as someone who presents as Caucasian. And yet the overall world doesn't understand what their lived experience is. And for that reason, she resists being placed in a box. When an official form, like the census, asks for her race, she sometimes checks the box for African American. Often, though, she chooses the option other. Yeah, that is actually quite liberating. It comes back to the idea that I am the one that gets to choose who I am and and how I identify. Thanks to Natalie Devora for sharing her story with us. She wrote a memoir. It's called Black Girl, White Skin, A Life in Stories. So, if skin color can't tell you a person's race, what can? This is Top of Mind. I'm Julie Rose. Today on Top of Mind, what is race? Surveys show that most Americans believe something innately genetic makes each race unique, that a black person is biologically different in fundamental ways from a white person. Even doctors tend to believe this. For example, black Americans are often undertreated for pain compared to white Americans. One recent study found a substantial number of medical students and residents believe black people have higher pain tolerance and thicker skin, which is not true. So why do these beliefs persist? Our eyes trick us a lot. You know, we we are a very visual species and skin color has become very meaningful for us. It's imbued with huge meaning um, through culture. And, you know, the idea of race has become real to us through history, although it's a nefarious biological myth. This is Alan Goodman. Professor of Biological Anthropology at Hampshire College. Goodman wrote a book called Racism, Not Race, along with his co-author. Dr. Joseph L. Graves, Jr., Professor of Biological Sciences at North Carolina A&T State University. Goodman and Graves say that biological race is not real. There are two um, definitions of race. Biological race is determined by the amount of genetic variation and its distribution within a species. 
um, socially defined race, however, um, is arbitrary with regard to the characteristics it uses. It can use physical traits. It can use cultural traits. It can use religion. So race definitely exists. It's just that we often confuse the two definitions of it. We look at socially defined race and think that it is rooted in biology, says Graves. I never say the word race without qualifying it. Socially defined race in America is real as a heart attack, and it gives people heart attacks. Our species, anatomically modern humans, does not have any biological races. The social definitions of race were made up in the context of a specific culture and social hierarchy as they are around the world. And one of the things that Alan and I point out in the book is that those social definitions vary both in time and space. So black in Brazil is different from black in the United States, is different from black in the UK. And these socially defined categories of race are rooted in racism, says Goodman. One of the very famous beginnings is Linnaeus's classification of human types in 1758, um, where he outlines different types and classifies individuals based on skin color and ability to govern. And and he's basing this on travelers' tales and things of that sort. Of course, this is at the age of exploration or colonization, slavery. So there's already sort of the need to show that these individuals that who are being or groups of individuals that are being colonized and enslaved must be less than. And it became a scientific cottage industry to try to prove that races were real and hierarchically arranged because that was the only moral justification one could come to to justify slavery and colonization. Society decided to base those classifications mainly on skin color. But if there'd been a reason to discriminate based on eye color instead, today we might have a blue race, a brown race, and a green race. That's what Graves and Goodman mean by social race. Biological race is when groups of a species have substantial genetic variation. And that does not exist in humans. We do see it in some animals, though. There are plenty of species that have biological races. We just don't happen to be one. And so, for example, if you look at um, the genetic variation in a species like Grant's gazelle or um, gray wolves in North America, they definitely have biological races, at least as measured by the genetic variation criterion. That criterion's a bit complicated, but essentially two groups of a species have to meet a certain numerical threshold of genetic diversity in order to be considered separate biological races. Again, the way we define this is not by what animals look like. We define this by the genetics, the distribution of genes within that species. Now, this is because we found out a very long time ago that physical traits are not reliable indicators of genetic variation. One interesting way to think about this is um, about reproductive isolation. Um, And even though humans are a worldwide species, which is unusual, we've had no real long-term reproductive barriers so that there's always been gene flow between groups. But imagine uh, salamanders and the pond dries up in the middle so that they can't get across the pond, and so they become reproductively isolated. So that's what really drives, you know, the development of subspecies or races. You just used the word subspecies, so a a biological race could be considered a subspecies? The the two terms are, are equivalent. Biological race, geographical race, subspecies, they're all equivalent terms. It takes a really long period of reproductive isolation for a subspecies to develop in any animal. We're talking hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. And since humans have always been a migratory and social species, there's never been a barrier that kept us apart long enough to develop a subspecies or biological race. Now that we know in great detail the structure of human genetic variation, it's absolutely clear that we don't come in anything close to color-coded races. 
two Africans are more different from each other than an average African is from a European or Asian. Wait, what do you so, mean? What do you mean by that, Dr. Professor Goodman? So, in what ways would two Africans be you, more different you, from each other than they would from a European? Yeah. When you know the evolutionary history of our species, it makes sense because we developed in Africa. That's where we developed a lot of variation. So any two Africans tend to be more, really genetically different from each other than any one of them is from a European or Asian, which is essentially a subset of Africans that lost some of that African variation when they migrated out of Africa probably about 70,000 years ago. And that time span has not let enough time for them to develop much new variation. Okay, so how, how do we explain, though, that people native to Norway have lighter skin and light eyes, and people native to Nigeria have darker skin yeah, and dark an eyes? Um, skin color is very simple to explain. Our species, anatomically modern humans, evolved in Africa. Everyone in it had dark pigmentation. And that was so for the first 200,000 years of human existence. And then around 100,000 years ago, as the glacial ice sheets in the northern hemisphere began to recede, ways out of Africa opened up and people began to migrate in small groups. Now, as they began to migrate to new environments, natural selection begins to act on specific genes to help them live in those new environments. And one of the things that occurred was in the migration into northern latitudes, the loss of pigmentation. Now, there are a number of theories um, about why this was good, uh, a lot of it having to do with synthesis of vitamin D, uh, being more efficient in, in lighter pigmented individuals at northern latitudes. Professor Graves, how do we... How do we explain the differences in athletic ability, the disproportionately large number of people with darker skin, Africans, African-Americans, who are elite basketball or football players or runners, marathoners, if that's not evidence of some sort of, you know, genetic ability that is common to a specific race, as we would define it in American culture, what is it? Success in the NBA for African-Americans is a relatively recent phenomenon, mm. again, dating to the 60s. The NBA has been around for a long time. Now, racial segregation in America made it impossible for a lot of African-Americans to participate in professional sports. But even then, when you look at the league, and this is another point that I consistently make, um, the, the dominance of African-American players is a recent thing, and there are very good cultural explanations for that. What are those? For example, the neighborhood, of, I said, the neighborhood I grew up in, we started playing basketball as soon as we could walk out of the house. In fact, I was an excellent basketball player. I decided to go on an academic career and not an athletic one. And I also played volleyball for the University of Michigan. And I was one of the only African-American players in the league. And the two sports utilize the exact same set of athletic abilities. One of them is virtually all European, and one of them is all African. So clearly, it's not a question of athleticism, it's a question of culture. Um, if you use um, dis long-distance running, you're talking about people from a localized region of Eastern Africa that's at high altitude. So a lot of different factors combine to make somebody good at a sport. Genetics play a part in terms of how tall you are, say. But a lot of it has to do with culture and opportunities you have to play that sport. And then there's the environment where you live. Someone at a higher altitude may have a larger lung capacity, which could make them a better distance runner, none of which has to do with skin color. The same goes for a person's intelligence. Educational attainment is one of the most clear and obvious examples of how structural racism works in the United States. Professor Graves experienced this as a black student in Westfield, New Jersey in the 1960s. So when they put me in kindergarten, they assumed 
that I was mentally slow because I was a behavior problem and I was tracked into an educational program for children of lower ability. The reason I was a behavior problem was because I finished my work so quickly and I had, you know, five-year-old kid, little boy who has nothing to do in the classroom. Of course, they're going to become a behavior problem. So the story of, of how they figured out that I really wasn't mentally inferior um, occurred when a young student teacher came to our, our elementary school. She saw me in the library reading a copy of Harold Lamb's book, The Crusades. Um, and all the other teachers assumed that I opened these big books just because I was showing out and actually couldn't read. So this student teacher sat down with me and she said, little boy, what are you reading about? And then I proceeded to tell her the story of the First Crusade and all of my favorite moments and all of my favorite people. And then they realize, oh my gosh, they have an advanced child on their hands. And the next day, I was moved into the advanced learning group. And why did they assume that you were slow? Like, this was something that they did with all African-American students in this integrated school district? Every African-American kid in my elementary school was in the same class. They started out with this blanket assumption of of African mental inferiority, which this country, by the way, was founded on, and with which education in this country still um, suffers from woefully inadequate opportunities. It's an opportunity gap. I, I have been involved in examples demonstrating that. In this case, this was Latino children in Phoenix from very poor neighborhoods, single mother households. Um, But they were in an elementary school that was in the shadow of the Phoenix airport. And so it had a great deal of tax revenue from that airport, which meant they had the best classrooms, they could hire the best teachers, they could hire teacher aides. And those kids did fantastically well. They exceeded all the norms in the state while they were in elementary school. And then the moment they went into the middle schools, which weren't in that neighborhood, their scores began to plummet and fall to the levels of the other Latino children in the state. So, yeah, there is definite evidence that if you provide people with equal opportunities at the beginning of their lives and you maintain that through their lives, that they do better. But that's not the situation in the United States. So if you wanted to make the argument that somehow Europeans or East Asians are intellectually superior say, to Africans or African-Americans, you would need to equalize environments across the United States. And then if there was a residual difference in achievement, then you could possibly claim that it has something to do with genetics. But that's never happened. But what do we make of something like sickle cell anemia, where 73 out of 1,000 Black and African-American newborns are born with sickle cell compared to just three out of 1,000 white newborns? So it's 25 times more prevalent in Black infants. How do we explain that? Human populations came in contact thousands of years ago with the Anopheles mosquito that was carrying the malaria parasite and were exposed to malaria. But there was a a nice genetic solution to that problem, which is the sickle cell. Let's break this down. Genes come in different variations called alleles. That variation often happens through mutation. When a specific mutation turns out to be really helpful in a population, it tends to perpetuate through generations. And that's how the allele that causes sickle cell anemia came about. If you have one copy of that allele in your body, you're protected against malaria. If you have no copies, no special protection against malaria. But there is a third option you could end up with two copies of the sickle cell allele, one from each of your parents. And that means you have sickle cell anemia, which is where there aren't enough healthy red blood cells for your body to function properly. Intense pain, fatigue, swelling, and frequent infections are all symptoms of sickle cell anemia. And the disease is most prevalent in places where the climate and mosquito population makes malaria common too. Malarial zones include Western and Central Africa, but also Northern Africa, Southern Spain, Italy, Sicily, India, okay, into Thailand. So the sickle cell allele exists in all those populations. 
And that means when it comes to doctors considering if someone might have sickle cell anemia, skin color does not matter. It's geography that matters. Whether that person's ancestors came from a place with a lot of malaria, which includes parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa. And while it's true that African Americans are more likely to have sickle cell anemia, that's not because they're black. It's because they're descendants of enslaved people who were trafficked from West and Central Africa, where malaria is rampant. There are other parts of Africa that don't have malaria, and those places also don't have many instances of the sickle cell allele. Places like uh, Algeria, it's basically non-existent. South Africa, it's non-existent. That's Alan Goodman and Joseph L. Graves. They're authors of Racism, Not Race. This mistaken belief that certain diseases only occur in specific races can have major consequences. Next, we'll meet a man who suffered the agonizing symptoms of a treatable disease until he was 54 years old. Only then did a doctor finally set aside racial stereotypes and recognize what was really wrong. This is Top of Mind. I'm Julie Rose. Let's hear now a real-life example of the consequences of believing in biological race. This is Top of Mind. Hi, uh, my name is Terry Wright. I'm um, 59 years of age. I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis just four years ago, I guess in the age of uh, 54. For half a century, he lived with horrible symptoms and no idea what was causing them. I had a very terrible stomach ache all the time, as though I was kicked right there in the center of my stomach. I'm walking around feeling that way all my life, basically. And I just stayed nauseated, was kept vomiting and over and over. I uh, constantly was just wheezing and gasping for um, air. As a kid, the pain was so bad, so constant. He says he sometimes wished he'd die. And I used to just kind of say, I'd just like to just close my eyes and not just wake up, just not wake up. Because I know when I wake up, it all starts over again. That's if I get the opportunity to go to sleep. Because when you're in pain, there's really no sleeping. It's just no sleeping. You're just miserable all the time. Without his wife, Michelle, who knows if he'd ever have figured out what the problem really was. The two of them met on a blind date. I truly believe in divine connection. I was confident that God brought us together. And I truly believe we were put in each other's lives for a reason. But I knew pretty quickly that something was wrong. Um, he, w- he was going to the hospital emergency room about two to three times a week. And every time we would eat, he would have to go to the restroom and I would hear him in there violently gurgitating. So I knew something was seri- seriously wrong. And, you know, that didn't change my feelings for him. Terry was 37 when they first heard the word cystic fibrosis. Within the first few months of us meeting, he started to complain about his chest hurting. And so we went to a walk-in clinic, and I'll never forget this doctor saying, if you were not Black, African-American, I would say you had cystic fibrosis. It was all foreign to me, that, that, that whole terminology of cystic fibrosis. But they didn't look into it any further because the doctor seemed so certain it wasn't cystic fibrosis. They didn't hear those words again for 17 more years. And then? Terry was looking like if we didn't do something soon, he wasn't going to make it. I I decided, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for different results. And that's when I went back into my pharmaceuticals background, and I remember the role of an infectious disease doctor. And usually, if nobody else could solve the mystery, they could. She gets him an appointment, hoping this infectious disease expert will finally figure out what strange virus is killing Terry. But pretty quickly, the physician suspects cystic fibrosis. 
and orders a simple screening test. Now, most of the time, cystic fibrosis is diagnosed in babies because the symptoms are so devastating right from the start of life. So Terry has to go to the local children's hospital to have this test done. And everywhere he goes, medical staff are just baffled. And I test, you know, positive cystic fibrosis, and yet they still didn't quite believe this black man has cystic fibrosis. So they had to do it again. Why didn't doctors figure this out sooner? Why did it take until you were 54 years old, Terry? I actually believe that it was just my, um, my skin color. That's, that's how I feel. My skin color. Uh, they they just, just didn't believe a, a black man could carry this disease. And a lot of doctors, I guess, lack of even their education or they, being impatient or just uh, out of ignorance. He believes it. I pretty much know it because, you know, we heard it right out of physician's mouth. If you were not African-American, I would say this is cystic fibrosis. And there's also racial stereotypes. So as a, as a Black man continuously talking about his pancreas, they assume he was an alcoholic. Right, right. Uh, they just look at me and just say, hey, there, there's other things going on with, you know, that the, it's a bad diet going on. You know, typically they just feel like uh, the majority of, of Blacks have a very fatty diet of, of Southern. <laughs> you know, we just eat a lot of bad food. So they just kind of stereotyping in that way. They just need to change your diet. Were you angry at all? Either of you? No, uh, no, I wasn't angry, but I was looking at it this way now since they have a name for this thing. Now, since you have a name, for, is there a treatment for it? Is there something that I can do? So uh, I found out there was things that I can do. And, oh, I wasn't angry. It was the fact I was a little confused. I said, all these years I've suffered for no reason. I could have been, you know, doing a lot of different things and been living a more of a quality of life than what I was living. I would say I wasn't angry, but I was very disheartened and disappointed. And and so what's it like for you now when you um, go to to get treatment for cystic fibrosis? Well, yes, they, they, they're looking at me kind of strange. And I have to go in and, and get a tune-up, shoot me with all these high-power antibiotics. And they have me in the room and, you know, behind the glass doors. So I have doctors and nurses kind of peeping in there and, you know, looking. You know, I, I kind of feel like I'm one of the animals in the zoo. <laughs> like this, got this black man in here with CF. And <laughs> it was just, just so unbelievable. But I have, I'm still being treated. What different today? Yeah. What, what difference did it make to get that diagnosis? What did that change for you, Terry? It, it made a world of difference. Doing doing treatments like a nebulizer. Imagine a slug, a, a slug slugs in your body. That's the mucus. This this nebulizer just kind of help help me move that mucus. And I had all this knowledge, uh, I wouldn't have to suffer early on. But did those fifty four years of not treating it cause permanent damage that you're also living with now? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, as far as my lung function is not up to capacity, um, I'm living with that. I'm, I'm living with a piece of my pancreas. Uh, one of my ducts gone, uh, my gallbladder removed. Uh, I've had several operations in my head that go up in there and try to open up my sinus. And, you know, each time they go inside of you, you know, and, and that causes scar tissue. So I'm dealing with the scar tissue. I'm dealing with the uh, the, the mental part of it, uh, being sick all the time. It's, it's a whole lot going on that I have steady struggle with. Uh, the inflammation in my body, um, uh, the, the uh, migraine headaches, the vision problems is all related to the CL. Even our inability to have children. There's there's a lot of things that CF impacts that may not always be comfortable to talk about. You never tried to track down that doctor who said if you if if you weren't African American, I'd say you had CF. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm looking for him. I'm looking for him. No, but, ser- but seriously, <laughs> we have been so focused on using Terry's story to help save other lives. And in that sense, it has not been in vain. So by starting our organization, the National Organization of African Americans with Cystic Fibrosis, we have been able to engage, uh, raise awareness, educate numerous uh, communities about cystic, the cystic fibrosis in BIPOC communities. We have been reached out to from individuals that said, until we reached you, we didn't realize African-Americans can have cystic fibrosis. It's so important, our role as an organization, because we're becoming that rare voice for rare individuals. We're advocating for them. We are here to make a difference. You don't have to do it alone. Do you think, do you think race should ever be a factor? When, when a doctor is trying to figure out the diagnosis, should, should they just be completely, completely ignore a person's race? Race is always important as far as um, cultural understanding, like understanding maybe some races may have a prevalent, preval- a higher prevalence of certain diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. But when it gets to a point where you are absolutely dismissed for having a disease because of race and ethnicity, that's when it becomes a problem. I think from a medical perspective, let me change that. I know from a medical perspective, you should address the signs and the symptoms primary Make, let that be primary, foremost, and then you can bring in some of those other factors. Michelle and Terry, it's great work you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing your story so, um, so candidly with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie, for having us. The rights are doing what they can to prevent misdiagnoses from happening to others. On top of that, there's a whole movement to address this problem in medical school by teaching students why they shouldn't make medical assumptions about anyone based on skin color. Something the rights didn't talk about is how being that person, advocating for change, can be exhausting. Because there's just days where you're like, I don't feel good. I don't want to be an advocate for CF. I don't want to talk about it. I don't even want to deal with it anymore. I just want to lay <laughs> in bed. And especially since it's like, I do still have it. This is Lauren Michelle, and she also has cystic fibrosis. As a Black person with the disease, she often feels like the poster child for CF and like she has a responsibility to raise awareness. I'm happy to take that role. So it doesn't bother me, but there are days where I'm not in the mood to do it or answer questions or I feel like I'm not doing enough, or it's just a balance of trying to, you know, figure out my life as well as trying to help others or educate other people. Banishing this idea that race is biological would help people like the Wrights and Lauren Michelle, but it would also do good beyond healthcare. Dismantling the myth that race is in the genes, is biological, is maybe the most important thing we can do today. It's the biggest threat to humanity. Bigger, I would say, than the COVID epidemic, bigger than global warming. This is Alan Goodman again, author of Racism, Not Race, along with Joseph L. Graves. Racism is foundationally associated with the the notion that some people are biologically inferior. And so when you look at the society around you and you see, for example, that the mean family wealth of an African-American family is only a tenth of that as a European-American family, And if you say, well, that's because, you know, blacks are biologically inferior and they simply can't compete in an economically fair market. And people say, yeah, okay, my position is earned because I was good at this competition and those black people were terrible at that competition. And so therefore it masks the fact that it's an unfair competition. 
And so long as people think that the society is fair and just, they'll continue to support it. So there's the danger. What difference does it make if if we're able to get rid of this idea that people with darker skin are inferior in certain ways? If, if you get rid of that idea, then you have to explain why these disparities exist. <laughs> the idea of biological race provides false moral justification for racism. How do we explain the threefold difference in African-American maternal mortality or the 2.2-fold difference in African-American versus white infant mortality? Basically, there's one of two ways you can explain it. You can say, oh, it's genetic or it's due to some aspect of lived experience. And it's clearly the second. And so getting rid of the biological explanation um, exposes racism as an immoral system. So there's absolutely an intimate connection between race and race, the biological race and racism. Um, the author, intellectual, ta Coates, among other people, has said that racism made race. And by that, what he means is that once we had things like we had in slavery and colonization, we needed an intellectual justification to make that moral. And that required us to invent the concept of race. And here we are a couple hundred, 300 years later, and we still haven't gotten rid of it. Do we perpetuate that by asking people about their race on the census, about categorizing ourselves, even though we know it's just a social construct, race? And that, that is a complex issue. The race classifications are neither scientific nor anthropological there. Yet, you know, with all its problem, without health and human services, et cetera, collecting data by race, we would not know that these race differences exist. So we still do need to collect data by race. But at the same time, we need to let everybody know, and I hope your listeners are getting something out of this, that in do, that that should not be biological. It is neither scientific nor anthropological. It is simply a social classification that is very relevant because we tend to treat individuals differently by race and class. Mm, okay, we're kind of trapped then. If we want to address the inequities, we need to be able to see the inequities, and the way to see the inequities is to is to is to use these race categories that we've that, that we've created for ourselves. Ag- agreed, but. There's one simple thing to do, which is that individuals have to know when we see race, we're not seeing biological differences. We're we're ascribing what we see to biology, but that's a myth. So we have to retrain our eyes. We have to retrain our brains. We have to retrain our ideology not to read into differences in skin color, differences in ability, and different types of people. Professor Graves, would you expand on that? What else can we do as individuals? What else, to be quite frank, what what else can I do as a white woman in America to to, to, to defang the, the notion of biological race? Yeah, the problem starts with the definition itself and the use of the word. I, I talk to all my students and, and tell them that you should never use the word race in a sentence unless you are qualifying it because most people conflate biological and social definitions of race. You can't assume that a person understands what you mean when you say race unless you tell them what you mean. And so that's what we need to do. We need to be clear on our use of language. What are we talking about? Are we talking about biological race or are we talking about social race? And most of the time, we're talking about social race. And is it appropriate for me to identify as white? That's your choice, recognizing that it's a social definition. But if you identify as white, then you have to then call other people black, red, brown, and yellow. So the important thing here is that when you recognize that all of these are social definitions, you need to treat them equitably. 
In other words, you don't call yourself white and then call somebody else Negro or call yourself white and call someone else African-American. All of these categories or classification schemes should be used in a consistent way. If you're calling yourself white, then you should say black. And if I call you African-American, what do I call myself? European-American. So be intentional about the labels we're using. Are we talking about skin color or where our ancestors came from? The difference matters. And we also have to keep in mind that social race categories change over time, says Goodman. I I consider myself white. You know, I'm identified as white. I have white skin privilege. Um, And interestingly, I'm... Ashkenazi Jewish, specifically by heritage. And before World War II, I would not necessarily have been considered white, but like many individuals from Eastern and Southern Europe, we became sort of honorary whites after World War II. So it's, I think, a a really interesting thing to think about is the category of white and how it's changed and been modified, who's been led into that club and who's been excluded from that club through history. Alternatively, you could just ditch the race labels completely, says Graves. My wife is Korean, and so my son, my oldest son, simply calls himself Joey by his name. People ask him, you know, what are you? He says, well, I'm Joey, because his mother's Korean, his father's African-American. So why does he have to make a choice? Until we really truly treat individuals the same, we're going to have at least social race. But what I'm absolutely dedicated to is putting the idea that race somehow is in the genes on the scrap heap of dead scientific ideas. That is Alan Goodman, professor of biological anthropology at Hampshire College, and Joseph L. Graves, professor of biological sciences at North Carolina A&T State University. If we can wrap our heads around this idea of biological race not existing in humans, it will help us to see more clearly where racism is happening and work to eradicate it. And that will take us closer to a world where we don't have to identify ourselves as a race on the census or any other form. We could all just be the human race. Thank you for tuning in today. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe, comment, or leave a review wherever you listen to the podcast. That'll help others to find us too. Top of Mind is a production of BYU Radio. Today's episode was produced by Ciara Hewlett and Lindsay Mella with help from Cleon Wall and me. We had music and sound design by Trent Reimschussel, Jacob Malaski, and the post-production team at BYU Broadcasting. I'm Julie Rose. We'll talk soon. <laughs> <laughs>